welcome to CX Today. My name is Charlie and today I'm joined by four excellent customer experience analysts and attendees of last week's Dreamforce event. Uh, and in this video, we'll be breaking down some of the biggest news uh, from Dreams, Dreamforce. Uh, yesterday, I'm delighted to be joined by Liz Miller, um, Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, uh, Rebecca Wetterman, CEO and Principal Analyst at Valois, uh, Michael Fawcett, Founder, CEO and Chief Analyst at Arian Research, and Dan Miller, uh, Lead Analyst and Founder um, of, Opus, uh, of Opus Research. Uh, yeah, it's great to have you all uh, join us and let's kind of get right into this uh, Dreamforce news. And I think probably the biggest news from the event was the relaunch of Salesforce's uh, signature platform as the Einstein One platform. Uh, this houses all the vendors, kind of CRM apps, Data Cloud, Einstein apps and more um, as evident in the screenshot that I'll just pop on, on the screen for all our viewers. Um, but yeah, I don't know who maybe wants to kick off and kind of talk to us a little bit uh, about this one. I don't know, um, Rebecca, what was your kind of thoughts on the relaunch of the platform and what really stood out for you uh, within the announcement? Well, the platform becomes a really important story for, for every vendor as we think about how do I have data and AI across all layers and all app applications. You know, like a lot of other vendors, Salesforce has grown a lot by acquisition. So bringing all of those acquired assets onto one platform with the same underlying code base, the same underlying metadata structure is going to be really important well, for performance and for whatever I do with AI and analytics on top. Yeah, I'm, I was calling it the great Einstein land grab because, you know, five years ago, you know, when they licensed the image, <laughs> um, it, it was sort of a placeholder for all things AI. Yeah. And now, you know, it's, it's the big brand under which um, you, you routed it off, Charlie. <laughs> Every single element yeah. you, can, you can think of is there. So, Absolutely. Even connecting up at the top to, to things like Slack and, uh, you know, Quip or Canva, whatever yeah. they call it now, um, <laughs> Tableau, uh, Heroku, and then the productivity connections too, right? So you can connect to uh, three, six, Office 365 and also to Google Workspace, which is you know, kind of ties everything in from a, an app perspective for a company. I, I think before and before, so I think it's important, you know, like before platform, which was really their <laughs> architecture layer yeah. and before Einstein one, which is now this kind of intelligence layer that weaves throughout the entire platform. But I think importantly also has the capacity to extend right before, mm. if we were talking maybe a, a, even a year ago, Salesforce was really its ecosystem, right? It brought everything into Salesforce and there was this great app exchange and there, there were all these great studios where you could bring kind of the rest of your ecosystem and the rest of your business into Salesforce. This is really a move now with platform and, you know, the, the infrastructure formerly known as Hyperforce, which sounded <laughs> so much cooler. Um, but with all of those things, great sassy names, now, all of a sudden, we're talking about a true ecosystem. Now we're talking truly about a platform that is pulling in as much as it's pushing out. And I think this really goes back to a moment about three years ago when Mark Benioff said on the Dreamforce stage, we can't just be Salesforce anymore. Yeah. Salesforce, you know, Salesforce customers uses other systems. We have other backend pieces of data that came in. So all of a sudden, with that statement of becoming part of a larger ecosystem, it was like everyone knew Salesforce had to change. Yeah. You couldn't have, you know, marketing cloud be this amalgam of everything built on .NET, right? <laughs> like you couldn't have right. service cloud be an amalgam of all these tools you brought in. So I think with Einstein's, you know, with, with Einstein One as a platform, this is really about allowing the intelligence that can come from within all of the different parts of Salesforce to now extend with Flow and with all other types of builders it now really becomes part of a business's backbone and infrastructure yeah. rather than this like little bubble cartoons known as Salesforce. Yeah. Well, you, you know, the, the, the open approach too, I think is really important. I mean, not just the integration across everything, but also the fact that they allow you to connect to any large language model or build your own. And that, I think that's a, you know, and, and certainly some vendors have gone in a different direction and I, I, I don't think that's the right play. I think this really is the way that you meet the customer needs because the language models, you play around with them, you realize they do different things. They're not, you know, they don't function the same way. And it just depends on what you're trying to do with it. You want to be able to connect out of the box to the major ones anyway. And I, I think that's a, I think that's really important right. in the platform too. 
it kind of puts data cloud in, into the center as well. I, I, actually, they came up with a, a, yeah. a great term that, that they harmonize the data from a number of sorts. You know, I've seen aggregate, ingest, all this stuff, but normalized. <laughs> um, they're harmonizing the data. And, and um, I, I think it, it, that's, that makes mm. uh, the choice of large language models or the bring your own large language model yeah. approach which I think plays into your discussion about the trust layer too, because yeah. they've also established a framework where you can do it safely and conform in and you don't mix your data with, with somebody else's yeah. um, whatever. I mean, Harmonize has long been the language of like CDPs, right? Or customer data platforms. Mm -hmm. And when we got into this weird land where everyone started selling a CDP as if it was like a marketing toy for marketing things only, yeah. we got into a very dangerous place where we started seeing again these data repositories pop up for individual functions across the enterprise. And I think mm -hmm. Salesforce's um, push to really have this, you know, at one point they were toying with trying to call it a data fabric. I'm just glad that they should call it a data cloud. It's, it's just data cloud. <laughs> just put it in there. Make Stop it simple, naming it you know? something silly. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and, but I think that the interesting thing, Dan, to your point is when you actually look at what happens with the data and when you start to hear another word creep up that they started to put into, Einstein One platform, which is the return of metadata being cool, oh. right? Like all of a sudden yeah. we were all like, wait yeah, a and image is forefront like now, and that's you, important. Yeah. Right. You saw yeah. people being like, wait a minute, I have to worry about metadata again. Like, whoa, <laughs> hang on. So I, I think that there's, you know, the reality is, is that anything that you were going to call a data layer that becomes abstracted, that goes across the entirety of your enterprise, that is decoupled from your applications, which is what they've done here. Yeah. Um, it is always going to do kind of everything you mentioned, Dan, yeah. right? It's going to normal, it's going to aggregate. It's going to, to normalize because it does have to do those. Like those aren't just arbitrary words. Those are words that yeah. have to happen with data. And they couldn't happen before across the Salesforce platform, right? Yeah. Unless you had the CDP module. Yeah, and to your point too, Liz, it's not a separate place that we go to across everything. And that's where, to, that's where it becomes important. And that's where the trust layer becomes important because I'm talking about not a specific transaction, yeah. a specific workload, a specific application, but across sort of my entire data. Yep. It, I mean, it had to happen. If you look at the progression, like, again, I think we all tend to think that like, sometimes Salesforce is an accident just mm. because it kind of, sometimes mm. it's portrayed that way. Like that what happens at Salesforce is like this glorious accident because Mark thought of something new. And I think that this year, like I sat there at Dreamforce and I was like, this has all been intentional, yeah. right? Cause you had platform <laughs> re-architected three years ago. You had data cloud really come into the forefront last year at Dreamforce. Einstein couldn't be the Einstein platform had data cloud not been worked out yeah. first. A lot like, of stuff that didn't make sense before made sense now. And it's like either either they were really smart or yeah. really hey, or, or and <laughs> both is fine, right? Yeah, both is fine. I mean, well, you know, I, in a in a survey I did uh, uh, last month, uh, the number one concern from from businesses was data quality. So I think that really goes a long way to to yeah. take care of that. And then you mentioned trust layer, Rebecca. I, I, to me, that was that was a hidden gem. And I, I didn't actually really wake up to that until I was doing an interview with, uh, with one of the folks from their responsibility uh, and ethics uh, office. And, and what it, you know, what I started to realize was in fact, they had something different and something that open AI has never done with any other company, by the way. And that was the capability to filter out PII and not, and again, go with a zero retention policy so gosh. that you didn't have the danger of privacy risk, but you also don't have the danger of that, that bad response. The fact that an upset customer says something and perhaps uses words that you wouldn't want repeated to them. If that goes into the large, large language model, there's a really good chance the answer is going to come back the same way because they're trying to pattern match. So. Filtering that out is a, goes a long way in in the customer experience world, and it's and it's a really simple thing that you wouldn't think about. But and then, like I said, I think the zero retention policy is extremely important um, when you're dealing with all the models because of the fact that once you put something in there, there's no telling where it's going to come out. So that, that I thought was a good it was a really uh, interesting announcement. Yeah, and I think too, the trust layer is very technical, right? Sorry, Liz. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's all very technical. The trust layer, but but hearing about it kind of reminded me of Dreamforce, like circa 2005, where Mark had to explain to everybody how you could trust putting your data in the cloud. 
now it's like you can trust putting it in the trust layer with AI, but we have to get a layer more technical, but also do a good job of simplifying what is a very technical message to a non-technical audience. And I, and I think that's gonna be really important and, and certainly showed last week. But, and and other than, I think metadata was always cool, but-, but um, Yeah, me too. But what, what you, um, <laughs> but what you just brought up um, made me think, one of the other things that came across is that you know, wh where you stand has a lot to do with where you started out. And uh, uh. So, so as this old, S a lot of discussion about keeping it simple, thinking about the old SFA days, who's going to use it, how are they going to use it? Um, there yeah. is a lot of spoon feeding of the value of, of these <laughs> these technologies that aren't just hard to understand, but, but a lot of people regard as a threat. Yeah. So um, it, <laughs> you know, the cute little characters help, all, all this sort of thing, um, you know, that, that Salesforce is famous for and, you know, what goes around comes around. And uh, yeah. yeah, there's real it, You know, I, what, I, what I loved hearing, especially about the trust layer, I mean, let's, let's be real here. People like Kathy Baxter, you know, in, you know, kind of re being a person who is like, her job is to make sure that all of these decisions, everything that's being done with data, everything that's woven across Salesforce is to really look at the ethics yeah. and the ethics behind it. Are we, are we saying what is true and are our models saying what is true? So I, I think that they've really put a lot of thought and a lot of careful thought into not only yeah. where they want to be as an organization selling to enterprises, where, where enterprises may have people on board who truly understand mm -hmm the intricacies of all these different forms of AI, that you do need different models, that you do need different corpuses of data, that you really, you can bring your own model, whether it's out of Vertex, whether it's out of SageMaker, mm -hmm. a very sophisticated team that not only understands models and prompts, but they understand data. But then you also have that average Salesforce admin at your you know small to mid-sized business. Yeah. It's just sitting there looking at like, I don't mm. have a PhD in prompt engineering. Like, what are yeah. you talking about? And I think that what the Einstein studio and what platform really does is it makes it accessible to organizations that really need AI as a differentiator, yeah. right? Because they don't have the massive army of people who know how to architect this yeah. stuff. And so I, I think that as we start to talk, as we start to look at it, I thought it was really interesting, especially how AI is emerging across Salesforce, that the leadership team that you have driving AI forward include people like a Kathy mm. Baxter, right? So someone who is yeah. looking at AI, but it also includes someone like a Clara yeah. Shin, who used to be at the head of Service Cloud. And I think for those of us who watch kind of service and things like contact center, and when we start to look at that very specifically, I think you're looking at a very people focused AI yeah. as opposed yeah. to a systems and a data. And I, and I think that is the difference that we sometimes feel at Salesforce. I think the other thing to really keep in mind when it comes to what's happening is this now opens up. And I think it's an important, important thing that Rebecca said earlier. This becomes the foundation and the reason why Salesforce can re-architect some of these applications, right, that are going to sit on top of this to extract all this goodness. Because let's be honest, Marketing Cloud couldn't do that two years ago. And right now it can't fully do it right now. And, and I think it's fair, but you have folks like Steve Hammond who are coming in and you have amazing folks like Bobby Janney and like Jay Wilder. You, it's an amazing team they have there. So I think all the struggles that Salesforce went through in the past year, which are a lot, right? Like activist investors, a lot of people left. Blah, 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 like, they kind of they kind of had an implosion moment. Oh, and I cut think them some it's, slack. It's, like, our, 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 oh my God. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, Dan Miller, <laughs> I, I think that the reality was is while everyone was really focused on what that could mean about the destruction and the chaos that that could bring in Salesforce, I think that there, I think Dreamforce proved that it also brought a whole lot of rigor and it brought a moment where yeah. everyone refocused and it became about what are we actually delivering? What are people going to see and not just dream about, but what are people going to do? And if you watch the excitement of all those folks getting their golden hoodies and all the folks that we call the admins and all the trailblazers, like the attitude. And I actually talked to a customer and she said, I didn't think I could do AI, which I thought was a really funny way to say it. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I could do AI, but 
I think I can go, I think I could go build this tomorrow. Like she had this like attitude of like, this is finally accessible to me. I think that becomes yeah. where things like platform and studio, yeah. that's what it unlocks, right? Is that, I well, feel like and, you know, the other thing in this whole wrapper too, and, and what I think is going to happen, you know, with, with AI, just like it did with cloud is the industry starts to, you know, you start to see industry cloud, you start to see industry AI, and they've already built that included in the platform. And I, mm -hmm. and that's going to be, you know, that's where a lot of value is going to lie for a lot of businesses, not just the horizontal use of it. You know, the assistants are nice and all the other things, but when you start to actually get into what you do every day as a business in your industry, I think that's where you're going to see a ton of value unlocked with AI. And just uh, just to kind of interrupt uh, the conversation, I think one, oh, one hey. thing that oh, I would... Hey, Charlie, you're here. Hey, hey, good to see you, buddy. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I just want to quickly pick up on the assistant um, point there. And obviously, the, what we, the one kind of yeah. elephant in the room almost that we haven't talked about already is the kind of co-pilot solution that will run across um, the platform, 991 um, co-pilot. I know, Dan, maybe I'll come to you first on this as kind of the virtual assistant um, a guru, uh, for lack of a <laughs> yeah, better word. As a, as a devotee <laughs> of, of the virtual agent, um, you know, I think, I think what's really brilliant here is that they detected early that it ain't necessarily going to be a character or, uh, you know, even though there's like the Einstein name, but to have a ubiquitous sort of mail slot that, that is, that you can converse with, you know, that's what makes, as, as Liz's customer put it, you know, they, make anybody can do AI because you're using your own words to, to either, you know, type something in and at some point <laughs> talk to the damn thing. And, and you're, you know, you're, you're conversing with this resource. Um, but they've also blended it into the workflows, the, the demo of, of, um, you know, you you finish, you know, some, you finish a, a discussion with a customer and then here's something that's suggesting what the follow-up email is. Mm -hmm. It's not replacing you because you, it, it just doesn't automatically send that you as a salesperson gets to read it, review it, change it, put it in your own words. But, you know, this, you know, this is how yeah. I use, yeah. you know, Bard or Claude or whatever is that, you know, sometimes it's the icebreaker um, that, that even an analyst can do <laughs> AI now. You know? <laughs> well, and you know, the, the, the idea I think is great too, in the areas where, you've got a lot of, of challenges. I mean, sales, for example, we know there's a sales productivity crisis for years. Now you have salespeople spending 75% of their time doing admin and 25% selling. That's a problem, right? So anything you can do that takes friction away and makes their life easier, schedules appointments for them, predicts, you know, which opportunities they should focus on, all those kinds of things. That's really powerful. S same thing for customer service too, having the ability to to search through vast amounts of data and surface uh, insights about a customer's problem really quickly, that that's going to go a long way to improve the customer experience. So I, I like it. I, I do have to say one thing, and I've said this several times to them too. Why did they name it Copilot? I just don't understand why every company that has an assistant thinks Copilot's the right name for it. And Microsoft's already sort of put a big stake in that ground. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a little confusing, but... <laughs> An even bigger one, yeah. yeah an even bigger yeah. one was announced this week, right? Where now it's everywhere, everywhere. Like it's it's everywhere for consumers, everywhere. But I, I think the interesting thing about Salesforce, Einstein, Copilot, I'm, the names are just getting longer. Um, I, <laughs> while I think that I don't, God, can't get a tattoo for a long time, anymore, right? God, yeah, I can't get that anymore. I'm just still going to get Clippy. Let's be honest. Like, I'm just going to get Clippy because that's the one I, I really want to have come yeah. back. But that's a completely other video, Charlie. So I know I miss Clippy so much. So I think the really interesting part from that, that I could see here was I think we, especially like the, the, the four of us, we see each other all the time. It's like summer camp every other week, right? <laughs> I, I think that what we tend to see a lot of is kind of a functional application of AI and these various co-pilots and how they can help an individual functional actor, a seller, someone in service, a marketer. We see how these, these co-pilots and these assistants get applied in a single piece of the flow. What I wanted to stand up and cheer about was actually Salesforce's capacity to actually not show how it helps the individual, but how that yeah. individual fits into a broader <laughs> customer experience strategy. So it's not just that I have a call and during that call, 
I'm getting up leveled recommendations. I'm I'm having I'm able to say like when was the, the time the last time this person called? I as the I, you know I as a service agent can interact and ask these questions. But then once that call ends, I now have a summary that goes into the larger system so that the original seller on that account. The person who first sold me my big giant plane, right? Or, the, or even the person who first sold me my, you know, my my lawnmower, whatever whatever type of organization you're in, it's the seller also gets that little co-pilot. It's like, ooh, you should see the summary. This is going to impact the the way you sell next. Marketing gets that, and now all of a sudden, a marketer starts to see, hey, there are a lot of these calls that have been happening. Look at the last five customer service engagements that involved your marquee accounts. Yeah. It's about weaving it all together. And to be honest with you, the functional stuff, yes, it was hard to crack at first, but thanks to generative AI and the advancements of these models and the advance, the functional stuff has been easier to crack. It's the cross-functional stuff that's really hard to do. Because again, earlier when we were talking about now it's part of an ecosystem, like, listen, APIs, they're great. Microservices, really cool. JSON, gotta love it. But it's really hard to connect all these things together. And that's what Salesforce is thinking about right now. So when you start to see like, you know, yep. acquisitions like AirKit and, you know, in CX, these are, this is a, you know, low code bot. Now, all of a sudden that seems a lot easier. That yeah. seems a lot easier to pull in, be part of platform, but then also it's not just gonna sit in service. Marketing is gonna be able to be like, oh, wait a minute, I can also do I can also collaborate on that because of Slack. I can collaborate right. on the low code instance of this bot that's going to come out. That's not just going to serve one function. Yeah. And Liz, and Liz, you make a really important point about sort of the cross cloud capabilities and what we're thinking about. The challenge I heard from customers though, is sort of like, yes, I get it. The cross cloud stuff is really valuable, but where do I start? Right? Like yes. if, I'm, if I'm a, Salesforce admin responsible for service cloud, how do I think about how this is going to impact mm -hmm. marketing? Or how do I think about how this is going to be exposed to sales? How do I make sure that whatever I'm doing delivers equal benefit as, as I think about my sort of cross cloud strategy? And I think one of the things that, you know, Salesforce quietly announced last mm -hmm. week was the customer success score. Now it's not available for all, co yeah. all customers yet, but I think it's really, really important for helping a Salesforce champion look out across those different cloud, maybe well outside of their functional expertise or their functional area, say, how am I using the platform, right? So it's taking telemetry from the platform and saying, how am I using it? Where are the opportunities for value that I'm not capturing? And then how do I think about either training or user adoption efforts or turning on certain functionality or whatever it is so I can really maximize value, right? Because the whole promise of this cloud stuff is we're supposed to get more value over time, right? But <laughs> as, as it gets more complex, rather than having a customer say, how do I navigate all of these different pieces, mm -hmm. putting telemetry in the app, in a dashboard so that a customer can see, here are my opportunities for value. Here's how much I'm using the software in this area. Yeah, and here's yeah. what I need to do to get better. Boy, that's valuable. And it's all at one low price. <laughs> that feels like a whole other show too, Dan. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> be in pricing. We'll cover that yeah. later. Um. Excellent. I think I think we've covered uh, an awful lot there from Dreamforce. I think one thing, maybe one final thing that we'll kind of just reflect back on quickly. I think Mike, Mike you mentioned this earlier, and that was the trust layer um, that's across this platform. I don't know if there's anything else maybe that you want to talk about regarding that, just how it crucial it might prove within this whole sort of Einstein one endeavor for Salesforce. I, I talked a good bit about it and, and I think the, the, but the idea, um, you know, if, as I really thought about this and, and you hear this in the conversations almost everywhere now, people worried about privacy, worried about uh, customer data, uh, data leakage, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and having the, you know, two, sort of two big things in that trust layer. One, the idea that you're filtering out all that customer data of PII so that, so that it doesn't get into the model and get used in ways that you can't even imagine what might happen, right? That's a, that's a huge issue in privacy, you know, and, and we're behind in the U S uh, it's certainly the EU is much uh, further ahead from a privacy regulation standpoint, but there are going to be regulations uh, that are going to impact this as well. And you need to be worried about that the trust layer takes care of some of that for you. And I think that's important too. Uh, but then, you know, if you also look at that idea, zero retention, 
and keeping things out of the model that can create problems for you. That's really important. And, and that, and that's the part, it's not so easy to control because once things get into the model, they do get reused. That's what it does. It uses that data to predict patterns and go to build new things and it will reuse your stuff, right? It's, that's what it does. And so you've got to prevent that. And, and customers are going to worry about that. But if they look at this and they say, oh, well, look, I've already got this thing that does some of those really important parts of that. That that's success in my opinion. And I think, you know, they, they talked about it. They talked about it. Mark talked about it on the main stage, but I'm not sure they didn't talk about it loud enough. I think it's really important because it's going to make customers have a lot more confidence that they can do this and do this now and do it safely. Well, I mean, you, maybe they're not saying it loud on stage, but we know that, mm -hmm. it, that uh, con the concern about privacy, the concern about how the data is being used is, a, is one of the biggest barriers to sales right now. So where, where it speaks most loudly is when, you know, somebody at the sea level um, who hasn't looked too much in the complexity of decisions and all the goodness of putting it all in one platform and stuff like that just sort of says, well, uh, legal says we can't do this. <laughs> yeah. well, there, and there are two big issues, right? So uh, you already have CIOs at organizations saying no more generative AI until we yeah. figure out what the legal risks are, until what we figure out what's happening to the data. So I think you have that issue. And Dan, I think you're totally right. I think there's another issue here that is going to play out, I would say, over the next 12, 12 to 18 months specifically, is it's great that there's a trust layer for a Salesforce, but Salesforce now as yeah. an ecosystem will also have lots of other partners that might not fit into that vision mm -hmm. of what the trust layer is meant to do. You know, Mark made a really bold statement on stage, <laughs> like Mark Benioff is known to do. He said, our business is not your data. And then when you then bounce into something like the trust layer, mm -hmm. my question is, what about your partners? Right, because yeah. there were several partners that they even announced, you know, very large, meaty ventures with, where guess what? Whether they realize it or not, and how matter how many times I poke the bear on a lot of these organizations, they have made their business mm -hmm. your data. Right. So when when someone sells, you know, a sentiment model, and I have the largest sentiment large language model. I know more about customers because I have all of these calls that have gone through my system. Yeah, yeah, those, those aren't are, your calls. Yep. Those are those are my calls, according yep. to the brand, right? Those are my customers' voices. That's my customer's sentiment. What do you mean it trained mm. your model? So now take that conversation and try to have parity with the trust layer conversation of our Salesforce's mm. business isn't your data. That, I mean, I can see some future conflict coming along with that because if you're going to have all of that type of data also running through this trust yeah. model, if you're going to look at that score, yeah. I mean, I, I was literally looking around the campground being like, and that, and like, hey, that company's, you know, business is your customer's yeah, data. Yeah, I mean, I expect on the, like, on the app exchange, the, the process, you know, the, the whole safety check process they go through. I mean, that eventually that's going to be a really important part of the, of the check list and it's going to end up weeding out some of those um, partners because they're not going to meet that level of trust. Yeah. Or, or you build a redaction layer and you, you... <laughs> that's and a we, whole yeah, other... a lot of good stuff here, Charlie. You have to, <laughs> we got like three other shows that we've forced on to Charlie. We got Clippy. We got, yeah, it's, it's all, it's all a thing. It's fine. Hire Clippy to do a redaction. That, that... Totally. <laughs> Clippy is out of work. I, I, right. I see you're using other people's data. Do you want, want some help with that? <laughs> with the big eyeballs. It'd be so good. Well, as you said, definitely lots of content uh, for us for the next uh, 12 months. I think it was a really great conversation um, today. because I, I, I think I was the only one that didn't attend Dreamforce, but I felt like I was there almost. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you all for all of our... Yeah. <laughs> and as the only person still in San Francisco, I just want to say I think the city did itself proud. I've only read of one incident where somebody injured their back or something, but um, yeah. I will say... Um, I think that it's, it's very interesting that Mark Benioff basically stood in directly in front of Mayor London Breed and was like, why can't it be like this all the time? And everyone was like, Ooh, what's the answer going to be? Like, Ooh. Yeah, and we'll see if it's in San Francisco, San Francisco next year, I suppose as well. That'll be an interesting thing to watch out Not for. Not like Google, geez. <laughs> 
But I suppose I better bring this conversation to an end at some point. Uh, but yeah, thanks again to all our four excellent analysts and also for all uh, of you for watching. Bye for now.